Okay, everybody. So I think I'm going to start. My name is Stefan Tilkov. I'm here to keep you awake after lunch. I want to talk not about a single programming language, but about more than one programming language. More than one programming language in the head of a single developer and more than one programming language in a system. I'm not here because I'm a language designer, because I'm not. I'm not here to pitch any particular programming language, because I like many programming languages. I like to think I'm here because I am a user of programming languages. I like to explore new things. I like to try out new languages and see how they're different from what I know. And I'm also very, very often in the, uh, I very often have the task of selling, of selling decisions to decision makers, of selling ideas to them so that they turn them into a decision. So this talk is mostly going to be about uh, some, some technical things, some soft things, and about whether or not this whole idea of using more than one programming language is a good one or a bad one. And I have seven theses around this, seven things that I've gathered. I'd like to, I, I wanted to come up with 10, but I couldn't find 10, so it's seven. It's the next magical number that I could pick, so you'll have to bear with me, with me for those seven things. And um, they vary a lot from, from the level and from the amount of time that I'm going to spend with them. And uh, as I said, some of them are more technical and some of them are more uh, soft. So let's see. Let's start with the first one. The first one, I think, is is one that's very obvious if you're, if you're looking at any particular programming language, with, at any particular program, programming language, which is how and why is this different from what I know? Aren't all languages we use equal anyway? And of course, they are, right? So languages are equal in a certain sense because we can, with any reasonable language, we can do anything that we can do with any other reasonable language, right? As soon as it's Turing complete, we can do everything with it. But they are not equal, which is my first thesis. If you look at the number of languages that we have available, and this is just a, a very small list of things, you will probably agree that there is a pretty big difference between assembler and what do I have here? Maybe Haskell. Those are very different, different languages. I can write, well, not me, but somebody who is capable in those languages will probably be able to write any program to do anything um, in both of those languages. But it's not going to be the same program. And I don't mean that uh, concerned with the number of, of characters or the number of lines it will have to type. It's going to be a different program because, to some degree, uh, the programming language we use influences what we can do. This is known as the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis, hypothesis, which is uh, something from linguistics. So these two people, Sapir and Whorf, came up with the idea that language influences thought, right? The, 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 the vocabulary that you have, the patterns that you have, the idioms that are available to you influence what you can think, right? The interesting thing is that in linguistics, that's been officially disproven, right? So linguists don't believe that anymore. But I think it's very true in programming languages. I think there is a huge influence the programming language has on what we can actually think of. Right? And if we know just a single programming language, I think we're very limited. That's one thing that I want to get across today. And there's a nice thought experiment done by a guy called Paul Graham, which some of you may know, which is the blub language. How many of you know the blub language? Anybody here? Okay, so let me explain that very briefly. This is a language that's, that's, ex that's been called blub to not offend anybody, right? So this could be your favorite language. It assumes that every developer has a favorite language. It's the language that you like to use and that you're very familiar with. It's the one that you use in your day-to-day -day work, the one that you don't have to think about, right? And this language sits at this, in this continuum at a certain level of, of uh, complexity or a certain level of number of features that it has. Right. This, is, this is your language. It has certain features and it doesn't have others because there are other programming languages, right? There may be a programming language that has fewer features. For example, your language might be object-oriented and this language X isn't. It doesn't have objects. Right? And there are other languages which are further to the right. This language, for example, might have a feature your language doesn't have, for example, closures, lambdas. Right? It might have something that you don't have right now. And if you're the typical programmer, I just assume you're not because you're attending a conference like this, but let's assume you were the typical programmer, then your immediate um, opinion of those languages will be, well, everything down here is something that's hopelessly limited. How, how am I supposed to work with that? Right? My language is way more powerful. I have all of those things, and if I had to work with that language, I would build all that stuff myself. For example, object orientation. I would 
because I, 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 that's how I think, right? So I'll add object orientation to the language that doesn't have it. Many people have done that, for example, with C. And of course, everything on the other side is full of features that nobody needs. Right? I mean, who would, who would need that? Because you don't need it, right? In your day-to-day your -day work, you don't need that feature. So you tend to view languages that have additional things as opposed to your language as, as unnecessary complex, bloated and, and full of academic stuff that nobody wants, and languages you don't, uh, that, are, that have fewer features as useless. That's the key. That's the key idea. I'm not going to read all of this to you. You can read it in his, in his blog post. And I think there's a lot of truth to that. I think we, we, we have a different mindset depending on the programming language we use. A, a C programmer thinks differently than a Ruby programmer or a Java programmer. Of course, they are both building programs in a Turing complete programming language. So at some point in time, on some level, this is going to be equal, but it's not the same way that it's approached. Languages differ a lot. Languages differ in many different aspects, right? There are many things that can differ from language to language. The paradigms it supports. Is it a functional language? Is it a procedural language? Does it, have, does it support object orientation, right? Does it support generic programming? The, the verbosity required to express something, right? How, how much stuff do I have to write? Do I have to spell out all of the types, or are there inferred, or are there maybe no static types at all? So the type system is a major Different, differentiating factor between different programming languages. Um, the, the, the amount of ceremony, I think Neil Ford coined this term, we're going to see some examples of that. How much, how much boiler, boilerplate do I have to write to get something to work, right? That's another, another aspect. We have the speed, both the development speed as well as the runtime speed of what we're, while we're building it and while, when we're running it, right? That's, that's a major difference between the languages. And often these are inversely related. So if it's something that lets you build something quicker, it may not run it as fast. And if it's hard to do, then maybe your program will be faster. Although we'll get to that, I'm not entirely sure I agree with this assumption. Languages have a very different learning curve, right? Maybe very steep, maybe not a problem at all to learn the language if you know another one. Right, so uh, the stability can be a difference. The language may change because it's very actively developed. A 2.9 release may be very different from a 2.8 release in some languages. Right? So that can happen. I think there's, there's a lot of difference in those languages, and some of us are not aware of that. So I don't know how many in this audience are Java programmers. Can you raise your hand if you're programming Java? So it's, I would expect that's the majority. So don't feel offended um, if I put up this slide by a guy, that's a quote from a guy called Steve Yegi, who has a great blog post called The Kingdom of Nouns. And he made, he made this observation, which I think is, is at least partially true. I think specifically the Java world has a tendency to, to see well, again, maybe not this audience, but the, many, many Java developers tend to see um, Java as the one language, the one thing you don't need to know anything else, and you don't even aware of, of many other ideas that are around there. And let me show you uh, with an example how different it is. This one is, is uh, uh, inspired by a, a, a video, a talk that Ola Bini did. This is a bit of Java code, so I can't do the game right now, but maybe you can tell me what this does. Does anybody know what this does? So I'm still counting, what does this do? Why does it take you so long to find out what this does? I mean, maybe you're all shy and you don't want to shout out what it does. Sorry? Too many words. Too many words. That's a very good comment. There are so many words on that slide, right? Orders by length. Orders what by length? It orders the strings by length, right? And what does it do with them? Print them out, comma separated. Excellent answer. That's exactly what this code does. I'm, I'm not, I'm not a, currently, I'm not a Java programmer, so maybe there's a more efficient way to write this, but I don't think it can get way more efficient than that. Now, compare that to the equivalent Ruby code. That is a lot less words, right? A lot fewer words. It says, here is a list. Now sort them by length and join them with a comma. Now, of course, this is a bit of cheating, right? I'm not using the same level of libraries that I have in both languages. It's different in Java and in Ruby. I could easily build myself a join method on some utility class and maybe import, make it static so that I can import it and, and narrow down, make my Java code shorter. But it shows that there's a difference in the languages, right? There, it, I'm not even arguing that one language is better than the other because they're, the, the major thing I want to argue is that they're different, right? It's not the same thing. Take a look at another example of Ruby code. This is from the documentation from the Rails framework, which is sort of a yeah, Java E framework for, for, for Ruby, at least it's a full stack framework. It has a lot of things in it, 
And one of, the, one of the things that it has is a way to express relationships between entities. So what you're seeing here almost looks like a DSL, right? It, you could call it, we could reasonably call it an internal DSL because it's very readable and very close to the domain, right? It says that a project belongs to our portfolio and has one project manager and belongs to one or many categories. That's readable and that's, that's, uh, that's something that Ruby makes very easy to do. It's very, it's very easy to build internal DSLs in Ruby. Again. You can build something similar in other languages. You can build something similar in Java or C Sharp. But again, it's, it's, a, it's a part of the culture, a part of the way programs are built in Ruby that allows us to do this. And there are other lots and lots more examples of that. This is a Node.js JavaScript program that is a full HTTP file server. Right. No, that's just the complete server. And it's full. I'm not going to, to explain everything that's on this slide, but it, you can see that mechanisms that are available in JavaScript are being used, like anonymous functions. Right? We're passing an anonymous function to the function that creates a server. And that anonymous function is responsible for handling requests and responses. Right? So that's, 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 a, that's something that's, that JavaScript makes very easy, this event-oriented, callback-oriented programming. Um, I'm not saying that if, this, if, you, if you have a thousand lines of this, that this is not going to be a complete mess. We can argue about that separately. But it's, again, it's, it's a different set of options that you have available, a different way to express your thoughts depending on the programming language. And I can continue with this for a long, long time. This is a closure example that's a complete grep command line replacement. Well, not a complete, but somewhat of a grep command line replacement. Right? And you can, even though you cannot see all the details, and though it's a bit tough to expect that you're able to follow all of that if you've never seen Closure, which is, a, as you've guessed, Lisp running on the JVM. You can see it in some, some, thing, some areas the different way of approaching stuff. So for example, we have something up there, um, a function called a print matches that, uh, no, let's take grep in files, which uses apply and merge and map. Right? Those are higher order functions available in a functional programming language that allow you, in the, in the, uh, the example of map, to map a function over a list, right? That's a, that's a common idiom in a functional program language. And it leads me to write this problem in a, in a very different way, very differently, different from what I, what I do in a non-functional language. There is more to life than objects. When we're using an object-oriented programming language, the mainstream programming language, we're used to having this one abstraction, right? We're building, it's a typed language, we're building classes, classes and types, that's the thing we construct, right? We build more and more and more of them because that's the main abstraction we have. Because if we don't have something, we have to build it using the facilities that we have. So for example, if we don't have a closure, we'll use a class and use a pattern to, to do that. I'll, I'll give you some more closure because I want you to get used to that, to seeing that, because I love the language so much, right? Think about how you would, how would, you would encapsulate, or how you would work with data structures in a programming language such as Java. Let's say I want to do a small library that deals with points. Then this is probably what I'd start doing, right? I'll, I'll start with a, with a very small class that encapsulates the single, the single type, the single information object, a point. Whereas in a language like Clojure, I would do something like this. Now, again, this is a totally unfair comparison. It's just, it's, this is because this is not doing the same thing, which is what I'm getting at, right? It's not doing the same thing because using this different language, you would do things differently. In this other language, you would simply reuse an existing data structure, a persistent data structure. In this case, it's a vector, right? So we'll create a vector with two elements to represent a point. If we do that, um, we get some benefits because these data structures, in, a, in this example language closure, have certain have certain traits that are valuable to most programs. They're immutable, they're reusable. We'll see that they're compatible because this is just a generic data structure, right? I'm using this to uh, encapsulate that information. So instead of, like I would do it in the Java world, adding a method, uh, in this case, to, to calculate um, um, a distance to the class that I have, I d and I've never understood why it belongs there, but whatever, that's probably where you'd put it in your Java program. In the, in the closure variant, you'd have the same, the same code, the same logic, of course, because that's just math, right? But you'd put it in a different place. It would be in a function, right? Now, this function can calculate the distance between two points. And now I can do interesting things. I have this data structure approach, and now I can do stuff that closure can do with data structures, because these are generic. The generic functions work with this stuff, right? So I have... Um, Something in Clojure that's, that's a very nice thing, which is an infinite sequence. It's an infinite sequence in this case, an infinite sequence of random numbers. Right? So maybe if I want to write a 
function that allows me to, um, to create random points. I'll now use this to build pairs of random points. Now, this is an infinite list right, of, of random points, and I'll take 10 from them. Now I have 10 points. I've just built points using the generic functions that are available in the standard library for me. And again, I can, I can go on for hours about the thing here. This is a, just a, a so, so somewhat contrived example. I have a, a, I have a number, of, number of points. I want to calculate the circumference, circumference of, the, of the polygon that's there. So I, I have all of those points, and now I have um, an infinite list of the, I repeat them infinitely over and over again. That's what this function does. And then I shift that one place to the, to the right, and then I have these, and then I build points from that. And then I map the distance func function across all of those things, one after the other, and then I finally sum that up. Again, this is something that I can do because this is the way I think in this language. Right? I'm not trying to sell you closure, even though it's the best language I know right now. Um, I'm not trying to do that. What I'm trying to point out is that as if, if I'm programming in closure, I approach problems in a different way. Right? It's a different way of programming than what you're used to, which supports my, my theory that those languages are not equal. Okay, let's skip over that. Let me highlight one other aspect of this generic as thing, which is uh, if I have something like this here, this is a closure map. Um, again, just using this as an example, um, I can access the elements in that map um, uh, very easily. So this is the way I would encapsulate a comp more complex data structure. In Clojure, I would not create a type for this. I would not create a class. I'd simply use the generic data structures to do that, which in the end means that I can, let's just go over that, that I can um, access things in those lists in a very generic fashion. It's kind of like only coupling myself to a small part of that data structure, which again changes the semantics of my program. It's almost as if this data structure uh, resembles this stuff on the right. Anyone know what that is on the right? It's JSON, right? So there are two functions in Clojure that allow me to go from a map to JSON, from JSON to a map. And again, that's an excellent example of something that's really different in different programming languages. If I, if I have to write a service that consumes or produces JSON, a language like this, and there are many others that share this characteristic of having easily accessible generic data structures, it's extremely easy to work with. Whereas I find it a total pain in a statically typed language to work with something like JSON because the idiomatic way of approaching it would be to generate code that has classes that map to the things that are in the JSON map, right? So every time I change the structure of the JSON map, I'll have to change the class structure that I've set up. Now, I know I don't have to. Again, I'm not saying it's not possible to do everything in every language. I'm saying it's not the default, not the standard way of doing things. So that's a major difference between, one major difference between programming languages that I wanted to highlight. And um, I think it's, it's, uh, it's just one, one sign that it may, may be more important than you think what programming language you use. You can argue that patterns, that design patterns, are a design smell. Right? So many of you, I guess, will have seen uh, that book, right? It's a, it's a very, it's a very, uh, very well-known book. I wish I had written that bestseller because it's great to write a bestseller in this industry. Almost never happens. But even though it's, a very, it's been a very influential book, um, you can argue that patterns are a weakness. And one guy from the Perl community does that very convincingly in this post. He argues that if design patterns were, had, had been invented in 1972, one of the design patterns would have been subroutine. Because in 1972, programming languages didn't necessarily have, I'm not sure about my history here, but didn't necessarily have subroutines built in. Maybe it's 1965, whatever. So one way to do that would be to describe this as a pattern, right? You put some variables on the stack or in some registers, you put a return address, then you call a function and it'll take the, uh, the parameters and it'll do something and it'll return to the return address. I mean, that's a pattern, right? We, we, we never would accept a language that required us to actually do that, but we do accept languages that require us to code lots of other common patterns. What's the reason we're accepting that? There's an old paper by Peter Norvig, who is now, I think, the head of search research or something at Google, where he, where he look, took a look at the book and described how those, the patterns in the book map to features of dynamic and functional programming languages. Again, I am a big fan of dynamic languages and functional languages, but it, this, this pattern, again, this, this idea translates to any two languages, right? If there is something that you can see yourself doing over and over again, maybe it's a good idea to think about whether or not that might be a part of your, of your that should be part of your programming language, and maybe there's a different one that does this differently. 
Now, I promised in the abstract of the talk that I'd give some examples. So in between all of my theoretical stuff, I have some, some examples thrown in. This is the first one. So I think that's a good case that shows when and where you might be able to profit from different languages. So this is one project we did where we actually had uh, modeling information exported from a case tool and wanted to import that into a different case tool. The first thing produced XMI and the last one had a Java API. Don't ask. Don't, don't, don't do projects like this, right? But if you have to, this was an interesting thing. The guy who built that project took the approach of doing the, the interesting stuff, the transformation, the model transformation in Lisp. Because it's perfect for that. It's a perfect use case. Of course, he could have built that in Java as well. He chose to do the XML parsing, the data structure, the, the basic normalization of the data structure in Java, and then hand it over to a Java-based Lisp. It was not closure. It's a, it's a while, that was a while back and then produce uh, something that is, uh, that is then read by Java program to use the Java API. So you have different languages with different strengths, and you should be able to pick the one that makes sense for you. Now, having said all of that, I, I make a, I'm, I'm very convinced that programming languages uh, make a difference, yet it depends on what level you're looking at. So if somebody has the argument that um, languages don't matter, I, I concede they have a point depending on what it is we're talking about. So if you're looking at the, at the whole set of things that you have to look at, for example, if you build a modern web app, then of course the programming language is just one minor thing. Right? And I agree that it shouldn't be, shouldn't be the most important decision that you make, or the only thing that you focus on. Right? So they, from this perspective, if you look at the whole, at the whole, sub, the whole system or subsystem or at the whole architecture, maybe the language isn't that important. But they're still very different, and I think that matters a lot. Now, that's all pretty theoretical, right? We have differences between languages, um, and that's interesting. We could maybe always pick the best language for a particular case. Of course, we can't, right? Because the language uh, has an ecosystem surrounding it. And that ecosystem is almost as important as all the technical features of that particular language, right? And those ecosystems comprise a lot of different things. So we have the development environments. If you're used to the development environments available in one ecosystem, it's very, very hard to go to a different ecosystem that has a different idea of what a development environment actually is. It may come as a surprise to you, but many people think VI is, a, is an excellent development environment. Emacs is an excellent development environment. I know very few Java programmers who use Emacs as their IDE. I think I know one, um, and he's weird. Uh, but anyway, the, um, um, the development environment is just one part, as are the libraries you're using, right? You're using a lot of libraries, um, uh, and they make your life easier. Everybody would agree, to that, would, would agree with that. So having an extensive set of libraries is, is a very important thing. And they're not easily shared if you hop between ecosystems, right? They have different APIs and different approaches, and different ecosystems have different strengths in the kinds of libraries that they provide. Some of them have almost no libraries, which is too bad. We have different runtime environments. They may bring their own VM. They may work with a different VM, right? We have a different community. Community and culture, I think, are underappreciated differences between programming languages. There is a huge difference between the Perl community and the Python community and the Ruby community. Those are all dynamically typed, I guess still dynamically typed, wasn't sure after that last talk, but basically dynamically typed languages that some people like to call scripting languages. They share a lot of characteristics. They all have support for object orientation. They're all very fast. They're all very usable, very pragmatic. But the communities are very, very different. So it's a really a strong, strong difference between the approach you take there. So you have to make sure you take that into account when you decide which programming language or programming languages to use. Now, right, here's a bad example. That's also a project example, a large banking project that we did. And of course, it was not one of our employees who, who messed this up, somebody else, naturally, who was a great programmer, Excellent, an amazing programmer, and a Haskell fan. And I like Haskell, the language. I don't understand it, but I like it. So I, I, I'm not a, I don't object at all to somebody using Haskell, but this guy used Haskell, and only he used Haskell in a team of 15 people, and he used Haskell to build external DSLs that cre he basically created new languages, and you could use that language to create something that was saved in binary and then read by a Java library from the Java program, and he set up a pipeline where stuff was from Excel, piped through multiple stages of best-of-breed tools to create something that was an internal DSL that was then parsed with Haskell and created binary stuff that the Java program would read. That was an unmaintainable mess in this particular context. It might have been great if it had just been him, because he was absolutely able to work in both the Haskell and the Java ecosystem. Well, I'm not entirely sure he was able to work in the Java ecosystem, but definitely the Haskell one. 
Right? So that's not a good idea. You have to take that into account. And if nobody in the project wants to use anything else but this one particular programming language, convince them first before you introduce it. Don't do it on your own. Because they will hate you. I can, I can promise that. So no language is an island, right? A language has a lot of things that come with it, and you need to take that into account as well. That said, I think it's changing a bit. So we have those multi-language virtual machines, those multi-language platforms, right? Basically .NET and the JVM, um, which give us some, some way to reuse parts of our ecosystem. Right? Not all of it, but parts of it, right? We have lots of different languages running on .NET, on the .NET runtime. Um, we now have lots of languages running on the JVM again. It's getting better all the time. Fortunately, Oracle has not stopped that. So we have a lot of support for different kinds of languages. This will only get better in the future. And if you see what people like Charles Nutter can do these days to uh, target the JVM from JRuby, this is really impressive. They can create really, really efficient code because uh, the, the runtime has been extended to support stuff that they can use to, to do that very efficiently. Right. So if you look at those things that I mentioned, you can see that at least some of them are not as much of a problem as they were before. Right? So some of them are addressed by this multi-language kind of thing. Um, at least the libraries and runtime environment, maybe sometimes even the development environment, although I'm not too sure. I mean, I'm aware that on the, at least on the JVM, for every scripting li library, there is a sort of IDE support in, uh, in Eclipse and, and, and IDEA. I'm not sure that anybody who really wants to use that programming language will actually use that. So most of them stick with their existing um, editors. Again, I have another pro project example. I think that should be number three, not number two, uh, which is a, was a simple JRuby project that ran on the JVM and was able to simply reuse some of the Java libraries. Right? It was a, a nice runtime environment. It also had a nice effect for us that we were able to use JRuby uh, without really telling the customer. It's not entirely true. We told them, we'll, yeah, we'll use this fancy language, but you won't, you won't notice because it'll run in the exact same environment you have all of your existing stuff running in. So the fact that we can uh, target a different runtime environment enabled us to do this in a, in a programming language that we found was more better suited for this particular uh, project, and that was definitely a win. Right. Again, I, won't, I don't think that happened too much, but we'll get to one of my major reasons why I don't think that's such a major point. But at least the runtime environment kind of thing gets you into more scenarios where you can actually do that. Whereas I still find it a problem to get something like Erlang into companies because it requires a different installation, different runtime. So they have to compile something. This all feels weird to people who are used to running JVM based stuff. Right. Sometimes that matters. So these multi language environments enable a sort of diversity that you wouldn't be able to. To, uh, to support or that you wouldn't be able to sell to customers or to, or to decision, decision makers if it were not for these, for these runtimes. Now let's get back to the, let's get back to the title of the, of the talk that had something to do with polyglotism, I guess I changed it. So polyglot programming. I think one of the things that people um, fail to do is make a distinction between a polyglot, polyglot programmer and, a polyglot, and polyglot programming. I mean, those are two different things. A polyglot, um, in general, is somebody who is capable to use multiple languages. Right? It comes from the language world. So somebody who speaks 10 languages fluently is a polyglot. That's a cool thing. I'd love to be able to speak 10 languages. Sadly, I don't. I barely make, make, uh, make it with two. Um, so um, I think that's a, that's a thing we should aspire to. I think it, it's a very, very reasonable thing to do this, because when you do that, you, you learn to approach things with different views, right? Once you've used a Lisp, you will view the code you write in Java differently. You will think about different abstractions. If you're like me, once you've used Lisp, you go back to Java and say, Wah! and try to find some library that will enable you to do that, and then you'll decide that that's not a good idea because it's not idiomatic, so you'll drop the library again. Whatever, it helps you to think about those things. It might help you make a decision on when to go to the polyglot programming model, um, it might also help you to simply see, well, this is, this is uh, something where we should have a library that follows the pattern that we have in this particular language. Right. But it's also interesting to ask, which language do you use, right? So how many of you use a single programming language in their day-to-day -day work? So I think you're 
you're guessing what I'm getting at, right? The question should rather be how many languages do you use? Because nobody, nobody uses a single language, at least not in any significant project that I'm aware of. You have a whole multitude of different languages that you use, right? Some of them maybe shouldn't be called languages. I'm, I'm open to discussion there. But there are multiple ways to express stuff, um, and there are some of them are Turing complete, some of them are not, but there are different languages, right? At least in any, every web project I know, you'll have some JavaScript somewhere. In basically every Java project, we have some, something to add dynamics. We'll get to that as well. So we have a lot of different things um, that, that we already use. SQL is in basically every project and is not a Turing complete, but a programming language. Some, if you combine it with a procedural logic, we'll make it PLSQL, then of course you have something that's complete. So there are a lot of different languages that you already use, and everybody thinks that's okay, right? So it's tempting to say, we'll just use the best tool for the job. Let's just use whatever makes the most sense um, and get rid of this monoculture, which is, I think, a bad thing, even if you look at the original textbook dictionary definition of what a monoculture is. Right? A monoculture means that, you're, uh, that everything has to be the same. That's the, that's the most important value that you have. Everything else is unimportant. As long as it's written in that one language, everything's fine. I think that's bad. No matter whether you're talking about databases or runtime environments, operating systems, programming languages, frameworks, libraries, whatever, I think monoculture is always a very risky thing. And the very, the, 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 the very uh, I don't know, uh, uh, exemplification of this is this logo. Does anybody remember that? Anybody here old enough to have programmed in 1996? So that was the 100% Java uh, logo. Uh, that Sun back at that time used to, to describe a, a program that they set up where um, uh, that was, uh, it was there for a reason because they had this, this lawsuit, this fight with Microsoft about whether or not it's okay to extend Java with proprietary stuff. But at some point in time, this became um, sort of the seal of approval. If my program is built in Java and in Java only, then it's great. Which is kind of weird. I don't see that as a value. I don't think it's great if something is built in that particular way. Right? That's, I don't find that particularly convincing, especially since usually your database isn't written in Java, not even today, um, and even the JVM isn't written in Java, so I'd, I'm not really convinced that was such a great idea. But we still have something like that in our minds, specifically in the Java world. We tend to, to believe that um, every cool idea is only cool if it's done in Java. Right? If there's a great platform that would solve all of my needs, I can't use it because it's not Java. It's because we value the programming language too much. I think we're, we're making an error here, and I've tried to illustrate that. It's not a very great illustration, but I hope I get my point across. If you look at the, at the technology stack that you are using when you approach a project, you have a number of different aspects, a number of different things that you have to look at, right? And if I change something, if I add features, then that may mean that I have to add something to my technology stack, right? I have a different kind of remoting technology, different kind of UI model, different kind of database. So I'll add something. I'll keep the language and the runtime the same, but I'll add frameworks and libraries and maybe build some code, right? That's okay. We're fine with that. We're all happy users and reusers of libraries. But we don't do the same thing with languages. Now, it might be that if I add a language, this will increase, this will, this will make... This will create some cognitive load. People will have to learn that. People have to, will have to get, acquire the skills to work with that programming language. But doing that might actually result in something that's, that's less complex than what you have to do if you do it using just libraries and frameworks. Right? And I've found that to be true in a number of projects now. It's, it's hard to get that point across, but the programming language is just one. The syntax of the programming language is just, is just one small part of what you're working with, right? You think that if I use programming language X and I hire a new, a new guy next week, um, they cannot work with my system. It's, it's, it's just wrong to assume that they will be able to work with your system because they have to learn all of the other stuff anyway, right? They may know the language, that's just one aspect, but they still have to learn everything else. If there's so much more to learn because you have to build all of that yourself instead of using it because it's built into the language, then it's going to hurt you in the long run. 
So I think languages have a sweet spot somewhere. So here are some example criteria. Don't take them too serious, right? It's, it's just an example of where different languages shine. And I think Java mainly shines because it has this feature of being known by so many people. And if you pick Java, you usually don't have to justify that decision, which also means that you maybe can focus on other decisions that you also care about that require some justification. So sometimes Java is perfect. Um, the same is true for C Sharp or other mainstream language, or whatever language it is that is your blob. Erlang is an excellent, superb language. I think Steve is going to do a lightning talk. Steve Vinoski is going to do a lightning talk um, in the break on, on Erlang. Erlang is an amazing system if you have to build a distributed system that has to be up and running all the time, where you want to replace things while it's running, right? have different versions of the same code in the same running server instance. It's an awesome environment. It's not exactly the language that's so awesome. It's just a complete set of the language and the libraries and the, all of the know-how that went into that thing for, for three decades. Closure, as you can guess, is a language I like a lot. I think it's a general purpose language. You should use it for everything. If you don't do that, at least consider it once you have complex algorithmic problems and maybe want to use a multi-core environment because it's great because it enables you to write multi-threaded programs at work. I don't think that's, that's a natural thing. And Ruby, just to pick one, could add Groovy or Python or Perl, whatever. You might pick that for its productivity, right? It's not the fastest language, doesn't produce the fastest running programs, but it's a, it's a joy to use. It makes, may make you very productive, at least for certain things, and we can argue about that for a long time. So in my view, nobody uses a single programming language anyway. Right? That's, that's an illusion anyway. So we have people using multi, multiple languages. We should be open of adding more. And I'm going to get to that again in a few, few minutes. I'm not suggesting everyone picks their favorite language as they please, whenever, just whatever, just don't care. I'm not suggesting that because I'm, I'm too realistic to assume that could ever work. But it doesn't have to be one. It doesn't have to be a monoculture because that's unhealthy. My next thesis is around stability, around layers in an application. This was, I think it was also inspired by, by an Ola Bini post a while ago, although he chose different layers. Um, but the, the basic idea is that um, if, you if you look at your application, if it's, a comp if it's a complex application, it probably has different layers in some way. I'm not talking about uh, presentation logic and business logic and persistence. I'm talking about um, what's fixed and what's, what's dynamic, right? The parts in your application that you want to be able to reconfigure even when it's deployed. Those are different parts of your, of your application than the core engine, the core machinery that you have built 10 years ago and are still re reusing. Product people know what I'm talking about because you usually have that stable inner or the lower, lowest layer here. So if you look at those things, then you can say that there are certain things that are hard code and some things are softer, right? That's, that's what I wanted to say here. And those can be very different. Those can be very different things. So one way to approach this would be to pick a, pick a runtime. Maybe that's just the JVM. We're just using a generic run to, uh, 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 a specific runtime and stick with that. And then we'll build our core domain using Java, maybe that's some sort of DDD approach. We have this common language that, if, that we've established, and everybody uses the same libraries, and that's sort of the core knowledge of, I don't know what, a billing application, and uh, a billing domain. And then we have a specific scenario where we maybe wire this together for a particular scenario. And you can see that there is something softer in the top layer, which is this XML kind of thing. Now, I'm not using XML as a programming language here. I'm just saying that you extract parts of your program. Instead of putting them in Java, you put them into a software form, into XML, because you can edit that at runtime. And you can actually do something. That might be your spring configuration, or it could be property, property files, or whatever. And you can accept slight variants. Now, this is an interesting one. DSLs. I know a lot of projects. We do them ourselves, but I also know them from other, from other clients and other companies where we, we uh, use DSLs, domain-specific languages. And they're all the rage if you're if you're in the Eclipse world, right, you're building a DSL using a, a EMF and Xtext and, and all of those frameworks, it's absolutely fascinating to me that it's easier to get a DSL into a project that's been built using EMF than a different programming language. I never understood why that is the case, because actually I'm using the language that I invented, and I'm telling you that's better than using one that someone else invented, even though that other language has a, a bunch of 
books and people and conferences and lots of code and all of that. Now, again, I'm, 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 mix, I'm, I'm, being, I'm mixing things up here. Of course, the domain-specific language is hopefully really domain-specific, but often it's not. Often we end up building the stuff into those DSLs that we need to make things configurable, to make them softer than if we built them in our, in our static languages below. And this could just as well be something different, right? You could have JRuby or any other dynamic JVM language, and the same is true for maybe as having a mixture of C Sharp and VB.net or wh whatever, right? You could have different languages in your environment to introduce that. And that's, I think, a very, a very interesting thing. Um, when you look at, 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 at complex projects, you always find this. You always find those things where, where you add this dynamic, these dynamic aspects, because you need them. In real life, you need to have something dynamic. Which brings me to another quote. You can see I'm a big fan of quotes, uh, which is from this guy called Philip Greenspun. And there's even a verb of this greenspunning. Right? So he used, he used common lisp as the example, but it's not necessarily tied to that. The idea is that if you have a sufficiently complex system, what you're going to do is you're going to build a programmability into it. You're going to build something that, that can actually act as a programming language. And I've seen numerous occasions where somebody started with a small language, maybe just something to set variables, right? This is this, this is six, this is five, this is ten, and they, then they find out, oh, I could use an if statement here, right? Oh, let's have a loop. Okay, we're getting very close now. Now we have modularity and we have subroutines. Now we've created our own programming language simply because we need something that's available to us at runtime. And I'm wondering, what do we as developers know that the developers of these, these languages don't? And I, one, some cri one criticism I hear a lot is that those languages are, are, uh, are not performing well enough, right? We need to write our code in a, in, in a language that works well. I cannot build a system that scales and that performs in, in a toy language. But what we end up doing is we have our fancy static languages and then we create our own little implementations and we do that very badly in general, because we're not language designers. Some people in this room accept, accept it. So soft and hard spots suggest different languages, right? You have different aspects in your system, and those might be better served with, with, different, with different languages. Getting close to the end, so let's go with number six. Number six is the idea that in a distributed system, having a single programming language becomes less important. I strongly believe that. I believe there was a point in time where we had the idea that standardizing the programming language was part of the enterprise architecture strategy. Right? We use, we'll just use EJB everywhere and every, everyone's going to be happy. And people found out that even if you used EJB everywhere, you couldn't get application server from one vendor to work with the application server from another. Well, you could actually not even get two versions of the same app server from the same vendor to talk to each other. So in the end, we ended up with something different. I think if we look at a distributed system, something that's somehow connected, then we have to focus on the, on the connections between those systems and what's inside is far less important than we think. Right? They may be built using different languages. Hopefully, I don't care. Hopefully, that's true for other technology decisions as well. I'd like to use one of those systems to maybe use a NoSQL data store and another system to use a relational database, use what's best there. And um, I think the, 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 idea, the core idea that I'm trying to get across is that if you have systems of different size, you use different strategies of modularization, right? If it's a very small thing, you can get by with maybe a single file. If the system grows and becomes more complicated, you use different means of modularization. At some point in time, wherever it is, those are maybe Ruby numbers. At some point in time, you hit the boundary where it makes more sense to have more than one application. The same is true in Java as well. I don't know, how many of you have a code base with more, have a single system with a code base of more than a million lines? Anybody here? A few people. I really, really, I'm sorry for you. Nobody chooses to do that. Nobody wants to have a single system with a million or five million or ten million lines. What you want to have is something that's modular, that has different things. Because those bastards that have five million lines, they're totally unchangeable. You cannot do, well, not totally, but really, really hard to change, to modernize, to, to get into the next century. So again, it, it seems as if I'm suggesting that you don't have any rules. I think you should have a lot of rules. So I have rules on the left side here, which are maybe cross-system architectural rules where you decide how your systems speak with each other. And then you have rules on the right side, which, are maybe, uh, which maybe limit the number of programming languages that you can use. I understand that in a large organization, you want to limit the number of languages to maybe two or three or whatever, right? Whatever the right number is, hopefully not just one, because I think that's not a good idea. 
I'm not suggesting that you don't standardize that stuff. Again, that's part of the selling kind of thing I'm trying to do, right? It's not a good idea to tell people that they should not standardize because they all know that it's going to be hard to find people who want to work in an environment where everybody uses whatever they... Hmm. Actually, that sounds quite interesting, but I don't think any, anybody would want to do that. So the basic idea that I want to get across here is that you should have two lists, right? One list should be what you set in stone for the next 10 years, and one is a set of guidelines that are valid right now and that can change next year. So that a system from today can change uh, and can still talk to a system that's been uh, using the changed guidelines tomorrow. Right. And we have an interesting example of that where we have a bunch of very modular architecture um, where we have uh, both JRuby and Java systems that communicate through uh, RESTful HTTP. A lot of my favorite technologies in this particular example. And uh, this works really, really well. It's a really nice environment because we're able to use um, the people we have, the skills we have with uh, different technologies, and we still have a common architecture and a common approach. I think this idea that the, the, the modern way of doing distributed systems gives you certain freedom is a very powerful one, right? I care about providing that interface. And to get this uh, sort of disconnected from the language discussion, let me give you another example. Why would you not have a single system that uh, has to give you some XML based on the database? Why shouldn't that be maybe using the Oracle XML database facilities? Right. As long as nobody from the outside sees that, why not use the most efficient way? And the same is true for programming language, languages and lots of other things as well. There's one thing left, which is, of course, the most important one, as, anybody, uh, always, as everybody always says, which is the people, right? So we have lots of technical things. We have some architectural discussions. We have similarities and differences between programming languages. But of course, the people that actually have to work with those things are the most important aspect around here, right? And um, there, are, there are interesting things like, for example, the skills that you, that you have. Uh, I mentioned that before. The skills that you, that you need to learn a new programming language, um, uh, uh, or the, the skills in that new programming language may not be there already, so you have to learn the language. But if you, if, you, if you take Erlang OTP as an example, then Erlang, the language itself, is the easiest part. I think it's entirely possible to teach somebody Erlang over a weekend. It's not a hard language at all. It's a very simple, small language that doesn't have a lot of features and an ugly syntax. But it's easy to learn, and once you have mastered that, you don't know how to program in Erlang. Because what you have to learn if you want to build a distributed system is the libraries, all the stuff that's there. Now, those libraries, you would have to learn them in any environment, right? If, you're, if it were another environment with another programming language, the same would be true even if it's your standard environment. Right? You have to learn how to use that stuff. That's true for every environment. It's not tied to the language alone. So I think that's an interesting thing. Um, there's also another aspect, which is more, again, from, from, the, from the political side of things. Um, a standard argument against, against using different programming languages is that you won't be able to find people in the market who can help you, right? That can, that's that's a, a valid concern. I think sometimes it can work the other way around. I know a lot of people who would start working with you immediately if you'd offered them a closure job. Right? Because some people like to work with different languages and they're very attracted to companies that try something there. So it might be your secret hiring strategy to do exactly that. The community is a very important thing. I think if you're building certain kinds of systems, then the community can be a deciding factor because you pick the community that has the most experience in building this kind of system, and you just take the programming language and the libraries with it. Right? If, you, if, this is the, if this is the community that's really, really good in maybe automating operations, then, then go with them. Maybe that's for Python or Perl, not entirely sure. Maybe these days it's even Ruby. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe if you're into web-based systems, you really like the, 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 the Rails community and the, and, the, and the innovation there, maybe you should go with that just for that reason, for the framework as opposed to the language. Maybe that's a bad reason. It depends. So the community at least is a deciding factor, I guess, and you should take that into account. You need to assess the, the, the prejudices that people have, right? Sometimes they are justified, sometimes they're not. Sometimes it's a simple matter of trying things out and seeing, is this really as slow as everybody keeps telling me? Is it maybe just very easy to, to do this, this type of stuff with a different language? I had an interesting experience last week uh, when I visited a customer and we showed them, they're a very conservative customer, and we showed them um, a prototype that we've built using server-side Java um, 
uh, and server-side HTML generation and, uh, and a bit of JavaScript unobtrusively on the client. And, and uh, one of the guys said, um, well, we have this other system that somebody else has built. This is, this is uh, much better. It does everything on the client. And I'm not a big fan of these single page apps, so we talked about this and found out that what was great was not the fact that it did everything on the client. What was great was the fact that it had way, way fewer lines of code. And it didn't have that because it did things on the client, it did that because it was written in JavaScript. So the same application in JavaScript had about a third of the lines of code than the, same, than the system written in Java. Once you notice that, you start asking whether that's really a reasonable thing to do. Right, so trying things out and having a look at them after you've, you've uh, evaluated them helps a lot to overcome those prejudices. Sometimes you have a lot of dependencies. Dependencies can be, can be really technical. They can also be um, in terms of people who are attached to things, right? People depend on, on certain things. Somebody is a master programmer in language blub, and now you're suggesting they use language Y. They're going to be a novice. So who wants to go from being an expert to being a novice just because some random dude suggests a different language is better? But you're depending on that language to do that. I think that's some Java programmers will say, yeah, that's, uh, he's talking about the COBOL guys. Maybe I am. Sometimes it's a very frustrating thing. This can be in bo both directions. Again, the scenario from, from a few minutes ago, if you, if you let someone code in a language they hate, they're going to be very, very frustrated. And it's going to be really hard to uh, make them love the language just by letting them play with it. Sometimes it works, but if they really have strong, strong reactions, some things are a matter of opinion. Like if you're a fan of statically typed languages, some people are very hard to convince of anything else. The same is true the other way around as well, right? So maybe you can try it once, but if somebody has made up their mind for good, don't try to change that. And having someone use something new might make them frustrated. But the same is true in the reverse as well, right? If somebody really wants to do that fancy new stuff and you don't give him the chance or her the chance to do that, they will become frustrated because they have to use the same stuff over and over again. So frustration and motivation obviously are very closely linked. You might actually be able to motiv motivate somebody because they're finally allowed to use that fancy new language to prove how, how great that is. Whatever that language is doesn't really matter. The amount of en energy you can create using that is, is, is amazing. So, as usual, people matter most. Um, it's, no, it's, it's no real surprise to see that. And with that, I have a, my, all my seven theses listed here, and I conclude, and I would open up for, for questions. Any comments are welcome as well, and disagreements too. Anybody? Yes. Right, so I think uh, the, the question was, what about the long-term effect, right? Isn't it too risky to pick a language where you don't know whether it's going to be there in, in three years? M absolutely, it may be too risky to do that. I don't know your scenario, right? If you want to pick a language that's going to be there uh, 10 years from now, you have different rules than if, you, if it doesn't matter, right? If you're, if you're able to say, yeah, we'll rewrite it in a different language then. It also depends what the runtime environment is, what the libraries are, what the additional cost is, what the... What the um, where exactly you use that language for everything or just for a small part of the system. Um, some languages have been there for so long that I don't think there's a risk that they'll go away, right? For example, um, Ruby and Python and Perl and, and Java, they're all languages that I think are a pretty, pretty safe bet. I think even Scala and Clojure are probably safe bets these days because they have enough of a community to support them and they have enough of users to be interested in somebody doing that. But again, your risk assessment may be different from mine, so maybe that will narrow down the l number of languages you can pick from, but there still is definitely more than one to do that. Any other question? Yes. So that's a very good question. Um, sometimes it's not the good parts that, that, that you should be concerned about because they make it worth using the language. Maybe it's the bad parts that make it worth avoiding it. Um, I personally think there are definitely certain areas where you wouldn't use certain languages. So I don't have anything prepared for that. So for example, I wouldn't use um, a dynamically typed, more of a scripting language to write a high performance um, operating system. I mean, that's kind of obvious, right? Maybe, it's, maybe I have sort of a narrow focus and that's not a really good answer to that because most of the systems I'm involved with are web-based systems. And in web-based systems, um, performance of the programming language is just one very, very tiny thing of the overall performance in the architecture, so you have to usually not care too much about that. It's risky what I'm saying here, but usually that's the case. Um, 
I don't have any particular thing, but it's a great thing to follow up. I don't have an answer, I have to admit that. Right. Anything else? Okay, then thanks a lot for your time. Have a good conference. <laughs>